But uh, I'd like to um, pray first and then ask the Lord uh, just in, in blessing this time. I think there's something in here for us that, that is hopefully life-changing, hopefully long-lasting. Uh, that's something that we always want when we're... A pastor always wants his church to have something that they keep uh, with them a long time. And it, not just a catchphrase. Um, a lot of times I'll use catchphrases like be the stick or something like that. And people will remember that. I've got to be the stick, you know. Um, but we want something that, that really a spiritual truth that stands out to you. So in light of that, the youth here, well, those of you that are in the youth meeting, Thursday I'm going to ask you what stood out to you about the message. So if you need to take notes or you have the fine mind of being able to retain everything I said, that's great too. So, um, but keep that in mind because we'll be talking a little bit about it on Thursday, among other things. So, uh, but let's pray and we'll go from there. So Father, thank you. Thank you that we can open up your word this morning. It is your word. We can read it. It's living and active. Your spirit moves. We pray, Lord, that you would work in our lives this morning, truths in your word. I pray, Father, that you would help me to communicate things that are helpful. <laughs> Lord, weed out the things that aren't. And we ask your blessing upon this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 2, starting uh, at verse 1. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. I love this story. Uh, I think everybody remembers this story the most, since it has to do with, you know, tearing up somebody's roof. So we'll, we'll get into this, and uh, we'll see what God has for us this morning. So let me start and read this for you, starting at verse 1. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, that's Jesus... He was reported, it was reported that he had come home, or he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, and when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus perceived in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So we want to look at this passage, this story. And, uh, you know, I could speak all day on this, this one. But we're going to look at a few things, and hopefully you will be assisted with that. Uh, but my main point, which I turned my page already, my main point is faith in Jesus and his work overcomes our obstacles and limitations so that we can truly be amazed at all the things he has done. Faith in Jesus and his work overcomes our obstacles and limitations so that we can truly be amazed at all the things that he has done. So we're going to get right into this. The first point, how deep, I have a question for you, how deep is your desire to be in the presence of Jesus? How deep is your desire to be in the presence 
of Jesus. Now in our passage, we, we see that people heard that Jesus was back in Capernaum, kind of a word of mouth thing. It doesn't take much. Capernaum, Capernaum wasn't a huge community at that point in history. It, it was a fishing village and there weren't tons of people there. So word traveled. Now, how many of you have ever lived in a small town? Anybody ever lived in a small town? There's a few of you. The small towns, um, when Megan, for those of you who don't know, Megan Roque is our firstborn. When Megan was a, a wee lassie, when she was a wee lassie, we lived in Ohio. And we would uh, travel to New Hampshire to see my, my, our families. And, uh, and we would go there, and I would let my mother know what time we would be there and when we would be there. And by the time we got there, which was about, you know, 10, 12 hours, we'd get out of the car, and she would let us know who was coming, who we were going to see, what we were going to do. Everything, she had everything planned out for us because she had told everybody that we were coming. And they said, oh, this person's coming over at this time. This person's coming over at this time. And we would, finally, we just had to say, no, we're not, we're not doing that anymore. But that's, if you live in a small town, that's how fast news travels. Or if you talked to my mother, that's how fast news traveled. But, you know, when something is new, when something's special, it's beneficial, there's an emotional aspect to it, we usually respond to it. There's something good there. There's something we want to receive. And they heard that Jesus was back. And they said, well, why shouldn't we go see him? We better go see Jesus. So a bunch of people come out. They go to where Jesus is staying. And they were just crammed in there. They were just around the house. They were at the door. They were at the windows. It was worse than Black Friday at Walmart. It was terrible. They were just crammed right in there, pushing against each other, trying to see, surrounding everything, to see Jesus. But they were shoulder to shoulder, all tucked in there. So comfortable, I'm sure. And you couldn't get through the door, and somebody shows up. Some people show up that needed to get through. So let's look at verses 1 through 4 again. And when he, Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, he was, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there, were, there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Jesus is in town. They've heard that people are being healed. There's all kinds of things and stories that are going on. He teaches like no other person. We talked about last week, the authority. He taught with authority that nobody taught like that before. And they're thinking, you know what? We've got a friend that needs to be healed. We'll call him George. George the paralytic needs to be healed. It's blocked by people. There's no way. There's an obstacle. There's an obstacle there. We can't get through. How are we going to get, no matter what they did, no matter what position they tried to see how they could get in, there was no way they could bring four people carrying basically a stretcher, into this crowded house. When you need Jesus, no matter whatever reason it is, what obstacles get into your way? What happens in your life where all of a sudden, I need, I need Jesus, but it's just not working? There's something in my way. Now, some of these are very simple. They're very obvious. You know, one of the biggest obstacles that gets in my way is laziness. That's probably one of the biggest ones. Or we get interrupted. Interruptions is a big obstacle. Sometimes we say, well, I really need prayer. But what keeps you from getting prayer? What's the obstacle that stands in your way? You can't seem to take care of a situation yourself. You need prayer for that. Do you just kind of say, I can't get prayer for that. I'm just going to give up. And you just walk away. 
when you need people to pray for you and everyone seems busy. Have you ever seen that? I really need prayer today, but, but look, they're, they're all busy. I don't want to bother them. It's not that big of a deal. It's an obstacle. These are, these are obstacles. We always look at them as, oh, it's an inconvenience. Oh, it's just a, one of those things. The timing's wrong, whatever. It's an obstacle. We get these obstacles in our way. We need to see Jesus. When we need to see that we need Jesus as our Lord and Savior, sometimes we're, we're uh, I don't want to make a spectacle of myself. That's pride, by the way. Pride is a huge obstacle that can get in our way. People might notice me. They might see me. So you don't move forward. The spiritual battles and obstacles, many times are very simple, simple things, but what happens is they turn into these giant mountains. They turn into these huge obstacles in our own minds and what we see in front of us, and it really was something very simple to begin with. And then when we have these doubts, which really can be a smaller obstacle, what it does is it changes our direction. Or when we have these fears, what well, usually, I don't know, when, when something fearful is coming, I usually stop. Then I run away. And I'm usually running in the opposite direction. We have these fears. We stop. We don't keep going forward. Or we're embarrassed. We're prideful. We're, we don't want people to know things. And when we're prideful or when we're embarrassed, what happens is we take our eyes off God. And so we're not even looking to God at that moment. We're looking at ourselves. That's what happens when we're prideful. Wisdom is something that the Bible speaks highly of. And if we're wise, if we want to be wise, and I recommend this, I recommend it to me, if we want to be wise in how to deal with obstacles, first we'll humble ourselves, and then we'll pray. Humble ourselves, and then we'll pray. Don't allow obstacles to get in the way of your relationship with God. When you're going to Jesus and he's the only one that take, can take care of it, don't let an obstacle keep you from doing that. Don't let an obstacle keep you from doing what God's called you to do. Obstacles are not our friends, and that, but they can be overcome. You know, with God, obstacles can be moved. Scripturally speaking, obstacles can be removed from us. And we want to see that sometimes obstacles are opportunities. They're opportunities for us to, to go forth. Uh, one way to look at this, uh, and we speak that which we know, right? So I'm going to speak about surgeries. If we have a surgery and it's not going the way, our recovery's not going the way it should, it's not as fast as it could be, it didn't turn out the way it could have been, it's whatever it is, many times what happens is we start to lose faith, we start to lose vision, and we start to just become discouraged, and we become very self-focused because things aren't right. But all it is is an obstacle. It's an obstacle in our way. And what we need to realize and what we need to do is that it's, it's an opportunity to draw near to God. Obstacles are opportunities, no matter what they are. And I know there are things that are hard. They're very, very difficult things. But these obstacles are opportunities to draw near to God. But obstacles, like I said, many of them are movable. Many of them are. Isaiah 40, 41, it, it, Scripture's full of this, where obstacles are removed. Isaiah 40, verse 4. It says, every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. Even ground shall be made level. It talks in scripture about paths, crooked paths being made straight. There's something that God does in our lives to help us so that we can fulfill what he has to do when we're trusting him and we're not allowing the obstacles to go away. Moses in the Red Sea. Now there's an obstacle for you. They didn't have a bunch of duck boats lined up to take the people across the Red Sea. No, God removed the obstacle. When they come to the Jordan and they come to the promised land, what happens? They're worshiping God. Their eyes are on God. God parts the Jordan and they walk through. God removed the obstacle. 
They believed God. Of course, Jesus removed the biggest obstacle of them all. The obstacle between our sin and God. That's the worst, hugest, most immovable obstacle you could have. To come to the place where you can be forgiven and accepted as a child of God, Jesus gave his life for that. In the hymn, the words, what will wash my sins away? Well, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What will make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus' sacrifice removed the obstacle so that all other obstacles are nothing in comparison. You know, when people serve, we just had Memorial Day not too long ago. When people serve in the military and give their lives, or when, when public servants, firemen, policemen, they give their lives for a cause, or even a, a well-meaning neighbor saves the life of a child but dives in the process, they say they give the ultimate sacrifice. They give their life. Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus died that we can have a life. Forgiveness of sin, the great obstacle's been removed. Ask yourself this. What is the obstacle of you becoming a Christian? What was the obstacle that you faced when you became a Christian? What was the obstacle that you faced when you've wanted to grow in God? Was there an obstacle? What was an obstacle you faced when you wanted to serve him? Those are things that too often we just seem to, to allow these obstacles to keep us from fulfilling what God wants us to do. So back in our story, there are four men carrying this person, George the paralytic. Paralyzed here means physically disabled. Um, usually it had to do with like a muscle disorder. Uh, his muscles weren't working. It could have been a stroke. It could have been a you know, spinal injury. Who knows? But he could not walk. He had to be carried. And these four guys, they were committed. These guys were committed to this man. And they're carrying him to see Jesus. They see the obstacles. They're seeing a lot of people. Now, what would you do? Would you say, ah, I've done this with stuff. What would you do if you just saw a great crowd and it just wasn't going, it just didn't look like it was going to work out? Would you say, uh, I don't see how we're going to get you in there. Um, maybe, you know, George, we should come back another day. Maybe there's something we can't do. But too often, that's what happens. We give up. And we say, no, this is too difficult. This is too hard. They say, let's go home. No, they didn't say that to his friend. They wanted to see his, George. <laughs> they wanted to take George in to see Jesus. And they were going to do whatever they had to do. So they go up on the roof, and they dig in, and they remove tiles in the roof, and they let him down. How much are you willing to dig to really enjoy the presence of Jesus? How much are you willing to dig? It's not work that motivates us. It's not a work to earn something. It's a desire. How deep is that desire that you have to see Jesus? It's a desire to want it. You need Jesus. That's what you need. So the paralytic gets in there. Now, nobody, it's interesting, because it doesn't say that anybody had a fit about the roof. It doesn't, you know, they're probably all going, what in the, oh, well, you know. They lower him down, and now everybody's watching Jesus. What's he going to do? What is Jesus going to do? The obstacle's gone. He's before Jesus. What's going to happen? The story's starting to build. It's getting to some sort of climactic thing. And then there's kind of a little shift in the story. 
And this is my second point. And this has to do with the scribes, but I think it applies to us in many ways too often. Questioning God is an empty work. Questioning God is an empty work. Unlike most of the people that were there, there were some that had other motives. You might call it critical curiosity. There were people there that were, they were curious of what was going to go on, but they were kind of had a critical idea. They were going to evaluate what was going on. Have you ever gone to, into a church? You're going to say, well, let's see what he's got to say today. Uh, I don't like that one. I don't like this. I don't like that. We don't say, okay, Lord, what do you have for me? Sure, I say ridiculous things sometimes, but what does God have for you in that? What does God have for you when you're listening? They wanted to see what Jesus was going to do. They wanted to see these things happening, but they wanted to filter them in their own little paradigm, their own little filter, their own little mold. Is it going to fit into our mold the way we want to see it? There's a problem with the way of thinking in that way. And some, I'm going to give you a, this a quick list of three things that I think happens here. When we have that critical observational spirit that we have, that we have our own idea of how we want to see things or what's in it for me kind of thing, the first thing is there's pride involved in that. We can always bring up pride in every message, can't we? We can just, you know, there's always a pride problem involved. I had churches that are like this in the past, not this one, okay, uh, in the past. Um, basically, it's, it's our way or the highway. You don't want to do it our way, then you can leave. You know, this is the way we do things, and it's just a struggle trying to get anything done because because they're very prideful. They want things done the same way. They're not open to new ideas. The scribes were like that. They really weren't open. They were curious, but they were going to be critical. They weren't open to what God was going to say. They weren't open to what the Spirit wanted to do in the meeting. So they had this mentality, my way of the highway mentality, and there's no room for God to do anything special in that. It had to be done a certain way. It's not biblical. It's an empty work. When we have things so that we're so structured and so boxed in that we don't allow to work, God to work, everything we're doing is just an empty work. It's something that we're doing on our own. The second thing is, there was an educational aspect to the problem. And this was the scribes. The scribes were taught things. Christians could struggle with this too. It's outside of the familiar. When things are something just so different, we can't really understand, well, why would we do it that way kind of thing? You know, the scribes were probably saying, well, my rabbi didn't teach me that way. And what Jesus is saying, I'm, not, I'm having trouble with because that's not the way I was taught. That's how denominations get formed, I think. That's, <laughs> these people go, well, we, we think it's this way. So they go over there and they go, no, well, we think it's over there. So they go over here. And they think it's wrong. It's an empty work when we limit God to what he's doing. The third thing is, when we think, when there's a thought that our minds, okay, when there's a thought that our minds or our reasoning power is superior to everything else, it's because of what I know, I have a very good mind, and what I know is the way it should be. We say, well, I don't really fully understand that because it's, it's not, my reasoning is superior to what you're saying and it's just not making sense to me. Okay, they, it's people, let me try to explain this better. It's people that sit kind of in a, a judgment seat over what they're listening to and trying to decide whether this is good or not and if it's not, they just push it away because they never had it before, they weren't taught that before and it's beyond their reasoning power to do that. They're locked into a certain mental viewpoint. It's like, I said I wasn't going to use any food illustrations, but I'm going to now. Roxanne and I, for our 49th anniversary, we went to James's for breakfast. And I don't know if you've ever been to James. Uh, 
this is, I'm not getting paid for this, but it's an excellent restaurant. Uh, but I always, they have a, they have kind of like an egg benedict, an eggs benedict sort of options, and you can have different things on it, and one of them has seafood cakes. And when you eat these, if you're not allergic to anything, which Roxanne is, so she can't, when you eat these things, you enter into a different dimension. <laughs> it, is, it is like, it is like, it's an out-of-body experience. <laughs> and every time I go in there and I get it, I just go, wow. I, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked and amazed and, and awed by this experience. Someone that has, they don't want to try anything new, they're mentally have their plan, and their plan is right. I know people that are like this, and they're not in this church, but their plan is right. They don't want to listen to you. They don't want to hear your teaching. Those are the people that would go into James, and if they'd never had these things before, this plate would be put before them and say, no, that's not what I eat. And they'd miss that experience. And that's what happens. They miss the experience. They miss God's blessing. They miss what God is trying to say. They say it can't be true, so it's an empty work. They can't wrap their minds around it. See, when it comes to Jesus, it is a matter of faith, not intellect. A relationship with Jesus isn't intellectual. It's faith-driven. We can understand that. I'm not saying there's, nothing wrong, there's anything wrong with education or, or learning things or something like that. But when it's, the relationship with Jesus is more than intellectual. It's a faith-driven thing. It's an emotional-driven thing. It's a faith and a trust in a relationship with God that you can't see. There has to be faith involved in it. That's why intellectually it's hard to wrap your head around it because you can't see who God is. It's faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Too often, when we just use our mind, it's doubting the things hoped for and criticizing the things not seen. Faith is a necessary part of our walk with God an absolute necessary part. The scribes, they criticized what they didn't know. They couldn't understand it. They weren't sure what was going on here because what they were seeing didn't coincide with what they've learned, what was in their minds. D.L. Moody once said, the scriptures are not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. We don't read scripture just to you know, rattle a lot of theological truths in there. We want our life changed. That doesn't mean you shouldn't... I have a theological degree, so I'm not saying you shouldn't go to school, you shouldn't study theology, you shouldn't memorize verses. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is, what's it doing to your life? What's happening to your life? My theology professor in college, I think I've shared this with you before, he went to Westminster theological seminary. He was educated there. And he, he shared this quote with us, and he told us who said it. It was like Van Til or John Murray or somebody like that. But he said, don't let the limits of your understanding be the limits of your faith. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it isn't true and that you shouldn't have faith and trust in God. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean you throw it away. We have faith. We trust God and we move forward. Don't let the limits of your understanding be the limits of your faith. So the guys lowered George the paralytic down. They didn't have limits to their faith. There was no limits there whatsoever. Verse 5 says, when Jesus saw their faith, it wasn't just the paralytics, even if he was acknowledging the paralytics, he saw their faith, the four guys at least, lowering this down. He, then he looks at the paralytic and he says, son, what a welcoming thing to say. Son, your sins are forgiven. 
And now everybody's waiting for a response, okay? What's the response? At this point, nothing's happened yet. All he said is, son, your sins are forgiven. And so the, the scribes are starting to squirm. They're squirming in their seats, okay? Let's look at verses 6 through 9. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Blaspheming is, we're not approving of this whatsoever. It's an evil thing that you're saying. It doesn't go along with our theology. He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They're right there. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They are right. But immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that, that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? See, Jesus knows everything. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? Those scribes weren't saying anything out loud. They were questioning in their hearts. Do you ever do that? Do you ever question in your heart things and nobody knows what you're, what's going on in there? Do you ever question in your heart? You know what? Remember this. Jesus knows. Jesus knows your heart. It makes you think, doesn't it? It makes you think. So their thoughts were of disapproval. It didn't stop Jesus from continuing what he was doing. So what ha happens next? This is what we want to look at. So let's look at point three. Never seen anything like that before. Verses 10 through 12 we're going to look at. Never seen anything like that before. Verse 10. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. God working is an amazing thing. God Saving is an amazing thing. God healing people is an amazing thing. Last week we talked about that word amazed. We said that, uh, you know, as people were being healed, it said they were amazed. And the, the meaning was astonished. Some of them were fearful. Some of them were hitting each other going, look at that! You know, that, that kind of amazed. That's what it meant. Amazed here is a different word. It's a different Greek word that they translate amazed here. And amazed defined here, if you look at the Greek, it says, it says to throw out of position. Okay, all of a sudden it's just, something's jerked out of position, it's displaced, it's, you're thrown into wonderment, to be astounded, to be out of one's mind or beside oneself. A person in an extreme emotional state brought by a situation, using my words, their mind was blown. It blew their minds. This blew their minds. You can't really say it any other way, but that was their response, and they glorified God. It blew their minds, and they glorified God. Jesus, by doing something kind, by healing the paralytic, who was probably known by everybody in town. It wasn't a very large town. Small town, maybe everybody even liked the guy. And they were all concerned about him. They were probably pulling for him. Oh boy, here he comes. Maybe that's why they didn't worry about the roof coming down. They saw, here comes George, coming through the ceiling. All excited for him. Jesus comes to town and he heals him, blows their minds and they glorify God. Glorifying God here means praise or extol, magnify, celebration, to impart glory to something, to say that it's excellent. That's what glorifying. I don't think they sat there and said, oh, isn't that nice, George got healed. Oh, his mother will be so happy. No, they celebrated. They celebrated. They were excited. I think they were jumping up and down. There's more excitement there than probably when the Red Sox won the World Series. They were just excited about it. 
And I'll bet that town was affected at least as long as George lived. Because every time they saw him, they said, wow, look at that. This is the guy that was healed by Jesus. I remember that day. What are some things that have happened in your life that blew your mind that God has done? To me, it was my conversion. When I look back, my mind is still blown at what God did for me. Taking me a drug-sick, disgusting scumbag, taking me and turning me into what I am today. Changed my direction, life-changing, life-saving. Another thing that blows my mind is when my kids came to know the Lord. Blows my mind. I have two grandchildren that have come to know the Lord. Blows my mind. To think of what I was and what I am now. Blows my mind. God did that. It wasn't me. It's nothing that I've done. God did that. To be provided a wife that's willing to stay with me for 49 years. That's a mind-blowing experience right there. I think she still loves me. Blows my mind. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, but as it is written, was written, this is taken out of Isaiah, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. It's a mind-blowing statement. God has prepared for those who love him. God wants to blow your mind. He wants to blow your mind. Are you faced with obstacles, empty works, trusting your own mind? Go to the scriptures. My encouragement for you today is be amazed by God. Have your mind blown by his love for you the giving his life for you, the reading of his word and believe his word, pray and remember what he has done for you. Come to Jesus and be amazed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, when we read stories like this, we are amazed. And too often when we look at them, we say, well, that happened a long time ago but you are the God who is the same to yesterday, today, and forever. You still move and you work. You change lives. And Lord, we ask you to do that in our own lives. We constantly need changing. We constantly need work, Lord, and we pray that you would do that by the power of your spirit. We ask, Lord, that you would bring those that don't know you, open their eyes, their hearts, their mind, to come into a relationship with you, realizing your power, that you can take a life and totally change it around, is an amazing thing. To take a life that is very even successful, to take a life that is very even happy, and still cause them to turn to something much more special that you have. That's mind-blowing. So we thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace. We thank you for your word. Work it in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.